So we've looked at um, how water moves across semi-permeable membranes um, through the process of osmosis, which requires that uh, the membrane be impermeable to solutes, and how that water movement um, affects the cells. Uh, so we asked the question down here, why does concentration gradient of solutes um, influence, how do, why does the concentration of solutes influence the direction of um, osmosis? And so it's, it's not just the concentration that we want to think about, it's, it's the fact that these molecules, when they're uh, basically in general molecules, um, have their own random thermal energy, their molecular energy that's contained in those bonds that forms the molecule. And this energy gives the molecule some um, random motion or kinetic energy. So when those molecules are in high concentration, then, they, then that's an area where the molecules have more energy and they tend to spread out and move away from each other. So the idea here then, really what we're looking at in terms of energy is that water doesn't just move down its concentration gradient, it moves down an energy gradient from high to low energy. And that energy is referred to as the potential energy of water. Um, Alright, so why does the concentration of solutes affect the um, concentration of uh, the movement of water? Um, it's the potential energy of water that's actually affected and we call that the chemical potential. Every molecule has in, in um, concentration has, chemi has a, its own chemical potential. Alright, so chemical potential is symbolized with mu and we can define mu as the free energy per mole of a of substance of any particular substance compared to the free energy of that substance energy of that substance at standard temperature and pressure. And standard temperature we're going to use 25 degrees C. Standard pressure is one atmosphere and we're going to convert that into a unit that we're going to be seeing more of which is called uh, megapascals. So one atmosphere equals one, uh, 0 0.1 or one tenth of a um, of megapascals. Alright, so getting back to water interacting with solutes in solution, then the presence of solute particles does what? The presence of solute particles does what? to mu of water. So we're using, just to make sure, water's chemical potential. Okay, so see if we can answer that question. Um, Basically, what solute particles do in solution to water is that solute particles uh, increase the disorder of water molecules. Okay, and for example, remember that when a solute is dissolved in water, then hydration shells form. And so that binds up certain water molecules, whoops, hydration, certain water molecules from having, you know, that free energy to uh, move through the solution or across the membrane from an a one area to another. Um, so in essence, when solutes are present, the water molecules are now not just uh, randomly interacting with each other, but now they're interacting with the, the solute molecules, which is going to limit their, their motion. All right. 
So how can we determine, based on, um, basically to determine um, the, the um, concentration of water, basically, in the presence of solutes, is referred to as uh, the mole fraction of water. And that's what we want to calculate. And that will tell us, um, that will reflect on the chemical potential of water in solution. So the mole fraction of water is calculated as the number of moles of water over the number of moles of water plus the number of moles of solute. And so we'll put that in parentheses there. So what W equals the number of moles of water and S equals the number of moles of solute. So just kind of knowing some basic math as S increases, then the mole fraction of water decreases in solution. And when the mole fraction of water decreases, how does that affect the chemical potential of water? It's going to decrease the chemical potential of water. So as the, nu the number of moles of solutes increase, the number of moles of water decreases, uh, or the relative uh, number of moles of water compared to the total number of moles in solution of everything, um, and that's going to lower the chemical potential of water. So if we go back to our figures up way up here um, and, apply, and apply that same scenario, um, here is where we had a higher concentration of, um, well actually we had a lower concentration of solutes. compared to inside, which would mean what for the mole fraction of water? Well, we can just do kind of a relative term there, which would mean that the mole fraction of water was higher than inside. And that means that the chemical potential of water is higher. Than on the outside, than uh, on the inside. All right, and so why does water move across the membrane inside to the inside of the cell? We'll go back down here so we can write this out. Uh, water, as do all uh, chemicals, mo uh, molecules moves not just down a concentration gradient, but moves down a chemical potential gradient. So when the inside um, chemical potential up here, whoops, the chemical potential of water inside the cell is lower than outside the cell, then the water is going to move from high chemical potential into the low uh, chemical potential area, which means that water comes in. Okay. Okay, so, whoops. So, so we could say basically that osmosis <coughs> only occurs when there, uh, when there is a difference in chemical potential in water chemical potential um, between the two sides of a membrane. Okay, now you might ask the question, at some point the concentration inside is going to equal the concentration outside and in that case uh, that may eventually lead to um, where the water, 
the chemical potential of water inside equals the chemical potential of the water outside. And what happens then? Then we have no net diffusion. Um, and then we could say, as we said earlier, that the plant is basically in osmotic equilibrium. Does that uh, happen often in plants? Or let's say, is that ideal? Is that optimal for plants? Um, what, what's going to happen basically if if a plant um, so if plant cells are now equal in their chemical potentials and water is no longer moving across the membrane? Well, that it's not an ideal situation because remember the plant is always having to move water through it. It helps circulate nutrients. It helps maintain turgor. Um, it uh, keeps the mechanical. Um, it provides mechanical support for the plant. Um, and so we, because water moves down its chemical potential, um, we want to see how a plant can help maintain that chemical potential. So plants or plant cells maintain a gradient in chemical potential for water. So let's see how that happens here. This is, remember, water movement is a passive process. It does not require directly uh, active transport. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the diagram here to demonstrate how that difference in chemical potential, the gradient in chemical potential for water, is going to be maintained. So the diagram here shows us a root. And external to the root is um, uh, the soil, soil particles here, water, and so forth. And I'm just using this diagram just to help us understand uh, what the plant root is doing in order to maintain that chemical potential for water. So let's say there's a nutrient out here such as nitrate or it could be calcium ions, magnesium ions, potassium ions, whatever the, the nutrient is. And there's a certain concentration of these of this ion out in the soil. Um, and nutrients have to be actively transported in. All right, so we could um, basically imagine some kind of hydrogen ion pump, basically something, a transporter that requires um, ATP. So this is for active transport. All right, so nitrate is going to be actively transported into the cell. And I'm actually going to use this bigger cell just because of the room that I don't have. Um, and so that's going to help the cell. Active transport is going to help the cell maintain a higher concentration of nitrate compared to out here in the soil. And if there was, you know, if this was all a passive process, then the nitrate would actually move out of the cell into the soil. But that's not what happens here. The plant is actively transporting the nitrate. So if we kind of jot down a few ideas of what's happening, so if this is the soil, well, let's go in the same order as the diagram there. If uh, the root cell is here, and here's the plasma membrane, and soil is out here. Um, here is nitrate with a lower concentration that is actively transported across into the root cell where the concentration of nitrate is higher. Then how does that affect the mole fraction of water inside versus the mole fraction of water outside? Well, if there's a higher concentration of nitrate inside the cell, then that's going to decrease the mole fraction of water inside the cell. And out like, oops. We'll draw that. And if the mole fraction of water is higher outside the cell than inside, then that's uh, going to cause the chemical potential of water to be higher outside than inside. And as we just discussed, water moves down its chemical potential gradient, and that's going to allow water to, to enter. So plants can actually control the movement of water by putting energy into the transport of nutrients um, into the roots and basically all around the plant. So by moving, by actively moving um, or transporting nutrients, the, it creates a lower 
chemical potential for water in the area of high nutrient concentration, which is going to allow water to be drawn in. All right. So from here, we'll be uh, moving into the discussion of water potential gradients and how those are.